Hello, good people of YouTube. Mountbatten here. And today, as you can see, we have a smorgasbord of World War II era rifles for your viewing pleasure. What we're going to be doing is taking a quick look at each one of these rifles, talk about their unique features, how to operate them, and do a little bit of comparison between them and try to determine which Allied nation during World War II had the best service rifle. So, going from left to right, a quick introduction of each one. This right here is the French Mass 36. Now, this one is a little odd because unlike the other three on the table here, this one wasn't quite ready for World War II. The French, they were trying to replace the Labelle and they, of course, weren't anticipating the war to start so soon. So this was designed as a backup rifle for more of the reserve troops and the rear echelon, if you will, supply troops and things like that to use. But when World War II kicked off, they had to quickly press it into service as the main battle rifle of France, but it didn't quite make, the, make it in time for the Battle of France, and the French troops were equipped with a lot of labels and such. So, moving on, we have, of course, this one's made several appearance on the, appearances on the channel so far, the Mosin Nagant 9130. This is one of the cheaper guns here. It used to be pretty cheap, but um, not so more any day with the way that today is gone. This one fires 7.62 by 54 R, and it, it's probably the simplest gun here and definitely wins the award for the easiest one to take apart because you just... And it's apart. So yeah, that's pretty neat. Oh, by the way, going back to the mass. Now, this one is also an import, obviously. Century Arms imported this one in the 90s and rechambered this from 7.5 French to 308. Which 308 and 7.5 French are almost the same caliber. 308 is 7.62 by 51 millimeters, 7.5 French is 7.5 by 51 millimeters. So you have a little bit of a larger bullet here and it's a much more, much easier caliber to get a, my hands on today. So that's kind of a good thing. But in, in terms of the power and stuff, it is very similar. So moving on, we have the, the Enfield number no. four Mark one and showing that it's empty and 303 British, which is 77 by 56 millimeters. This has been on the channel too beforehand. This is a Canadian one that was made by Long Branch in 1950. So it was a post-war model, but it is again, functionally the same as the number no. four Mark ones of service in the UK and in the Commonwealth throughout World War II. So our last Allied rifle here has been on the channel before too, of course. This is the M1 Garand. Now this is empty. Now this is a pre-war Garand that I got from the CMP and it is in very good shape because this has been refurbished, it has a new barrel on it and it of course fires 30 uh, six quite a powerhouse of a round and the largest round here. Well, the most powerful round here on paper, but not the largest bullet. That belongs to one that we will be comparing these guys to, which is the Gewehr 98. This is the German service rifle of World War II, except not exactly. This is the full size rifle. The ones that the Germans used in World War II is the 98K, which is a carbine version of this, so it's a little bit shorter, but functionally the bolt and the bullet are the same. And this isn't exactly a German rifle. This is a Yugoslav M24, uh, was it M24 44 or 45, 47? It is a Yugoslavian copy of the Gewehr 98, but it works just the same and is much cheaper to get, but fires the same bullet, has the same action. So it'd be very similar to compare this to our allied rifles here. For our first test, we are going to be demonstrating the power of each round with a one gallon jug of water as a stand-in for use your imagination. Also, surprise six gun here. We have my MMP 15 and we are going to be running this one too today to give you an idea of how powerful a modern rifle is compared to a World War II era rifle. So just here we have a 5.56 NATO 55 grain round, just ball ammo, nothing too fancy here. And there's our water jug. So let's go ahead and see how 5.56 does against a gallon of water.
You know, I didn't think we were going to start off with that much of a bang. Huh. So, yeah, uh... Huh. This is what 556 does. 556 is just like uh, a 22 that ate its Wheaties. So this is what that did. Um, we're in for a show. So this is a 145 grain 308 round out of the Mass 36. Again, this is supposed to be 7.5 French, but basically the same thing. A slightly bigger bullet here. I don't think there's going to be any bottle left after this one. Huh. That's where the bullet went in at, and that's where it came out at. So, yeah. A little bit more damage than the 5.56, a bit, a bit bigger of an exit wound, but that's to be expected with 7.62 NATO. So, yep. Next one. Now 762 by 54 r out of our 9130. I don't think there's going to be a lot of water bottle left after this one. Well, not as much of a difference as I imagined. Oh, look at that. The entry hole is perfect still. And the exit hole is... Hmm. Doesn't have as much oomph. Now this is surplus ammo, and the first two were PPU, just ball ammo. That's interesting. Huh. Now we have 303 British, which is again PPU. This is a hundred and seventy-nine grain round out of our infield number four Mark One. Man, the the Serbs don't mess around, do they? So front of the bottle is wrecked. Back of the bottle is beyond wrecked. This will be shoot plastic things because they don't hurt as much when they come back. All right, next. All right, now we have 30 out six. This is PPU 140 grain because old gun is old and semi-automatics of course there's a lot more punishment on the internals than a uh, bolt action so well not a full-on 30-06 round this still has got a lot of power behind it what's fun too is that um i forgot to bring an empty end block so i had to put it in there with my finger and now we pray that my finger doesn't get eaten and there we go now we okay that's fun <laughs> cap so, um, we just blew the side of the bottle off. On to the next one. And finally, we have our 8mm coming out of our Yugo Gewehr 98. Now, the thing is, I was told this should be 8mm Mauser, this rifle, but it also could be 7, 6, something or another. Uh, however, as the internet says, if it seats, it yeets. It's the first time I shot this gun too, so like I'm not making it up. I, this this should be eight millimeter. Everything I've seen is said it should be eight millimeter. But the guy at the gun store said it might be seven. I think seven six Argentina or something like that. We're about to find out. It's eight millimeter. Oh, that ejector though, or extractor, whatever it is on this gun. Well, I know you guys can't really feel anything through the, the camera, but like I felt that a lot more than anything else. Um, however, it's not quite up to the 30, uh, sorry, 30 out six level. It's mostly intact. On to our next one, our next test actually. All right, so now what we're gonna do is a penetration test. We've got four sodas right here, all lined up. We're gonna see how far each rifle can get through them. We're starting out with 5.56 NATO, again, 55 grain out of my MMP 15. Camera woman, how many do you think it's going to get through? I say all of them. You think 5.56 is going to get through all of them? I don't know what those words mean, but it sounds big, and I think it's going to go through all of them. All right, let's find out. I think it went through two. Really? I think. That smells good, though. Mm, good old diabetes good. in the afternoon. I think I went through all of them. No, no. Oh. 
It, I was correct. Wow. Yeah, these are last. That's why this one's still like mostly intact. This one got, where did it even hit it at? It just scraped this. Is there even an entry hole? Mm -hmm. No, there's just a. Got the bottom. Oh, it just scraped it though. Like, look at that. It was deviating and it just barely got that one. Oh, no, no, no. Right okay. There. Oh, so it went in there, came out here. Yeah. See how this piece is bent back? All right, cool. Well, I thought I was, I thought I was gonna get through like three, maybe touch the last, well, I guess it did kind of touch the last one, but okay, okay. I guess we'll just see how much the other ones just screw up the, the bottles then. All right, let's go. All right, now we got Sam's Cola, Diet Dr. Thunder, Diet Sam's Choice, and Twist Up in that order. So I can know what I'm talking about when I'm editing this. But now we got the Mass 36, again, 760 NATO. See what it does. Well, obviously it's going through, going, going to go through all four, but now we're seeing how much of the four two liters are left. <laughs> okay. What's really cool about the Mass 36 too is that it's one of the few bolt actions, bolt actions I've seen that has a bolt hold open function. So when you're out, you can't push the bolt forward until you reload or until you depress the follower. That's pretty neat. Let's go see what happened. So we've got the Sam's Cola over here. That one came back at us. And the doctor, Diet Dr. Thunder got completely destroyed. Um, and no, that was from the- That's from the last one? That's from the MP. Uh, yeah, there's a Diet Sam's Choice. So, went under here, out through there. And that last twist up. Oh, here it is. Wait a second. Oh, it didn't go through it. I mean, it's, it's coated in the remains of its brethren. No, no. This is intact. That's weird. Well, what it probably is is that 556 five, is a very, very hot round in terms of the speed, so it's got more energy behind it, and that's how you get penetration. And 762 is a bigger round and it's slower, so that might be what it is. Or it just got knocked out of the way beforehand. So that's interesting. All right, on to the Mosin. So I must twist up. You survived, but we have a no survivor policy here, sir. And plus, I don't want to lug you back in the boat, back to the dock. All right, now 762 by 54R out of our Mosin. I don't know, considering how this performed on the gallon of water test, I'm not sure, because it, it didn't really seem to have a lot of power. And this is surplus ammo, so this ammo was actually used. Well, it's from the 70s, too. Let's do a little bit further back in case they decide to retaliate again. Comrade, you have failed. Ha! Huh. <laughs> That's weird, because 54 R is considered to be such a meaty round, too. Well, let's see, maybe it deviated off, because it didn't have enough oomph to go through them. All right, so the same color was in front. And where's the entry? So it went in, oh yeah, look, it went in and it deviated. It went way down. Or did it, no, no, no. Okay, so it went in here, out there, okay. This guy, yeah, it started deviating. It just, yeah. If you don't have enough oomph to push through all that liquid, you're just not gonna make it. That's what happened here. Wow, okay, all right. Uh, Infield's next. All right, now we're getting to the larger caliber. Well, larger calibers, these are all full-size calibers. The 303 British out of our number four, Mark One. All right. Ooh, that went. I think that went through all of them.
so PhD Thunder here. I caught him dead center. Entrance, then the exit wound. I can take my earmuffs off now. All right. Uh, ooh. We had two dots. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> All right, so we went in there and that's the exit. Sam's Cola here. Got him in the middle, the bottom, and just blew him apart. It looks like, or do, no, do we hit him up here? I think we hit him on the edge. It's deviating again. Where he went. He's still alive. Comrade twist up. I think the grand's about to change his luck, though. All right, now we've got twist up. I think uh, Professor Thunder, Sam's Cola, and our other twist up at the end. We want to put the two twist ups together because we didn't want them conspiring or anything. So now we're finding 30 out six out of our M1 Garand. Which again, no end block because it's just a single round. So you just put down the follow, dump it in there. Try not to give yourself. Ooh, that was almost bad. Ah. Oh, the sun's right in my eyes. <coughs> I don't want to say he lived, but I think he might have. First twist up, ooh. Oh, look at that. We hit him, that's the entry wound. There's the exit. So not too much of, a, of the energy being dumped here. That's, how, that's what causes the, uh, the uh, two liters to get all sprawled out and stuff. So. Sam, I think he was third in line. So he got hit in the center. What else is he leaking out of? No, it looks like he might have seen him on the side and just blew him off like that. Yeah. There's a rapper. Oh, <laughs> Dr. Thunder, <laughs> Professor Thunder has simply ceased to exist, ladies and gentlemen. So this is where the round dumped all of its energy. So that means that I think he's still alive, <laughs> ladies and gents. He made it. All we have left is, is the, the Mauser. All right, lastly for this test, eight millimeter Mauser out of our Hugo Gewehr 98. I don't know if this one's gonna make it all the way through. It's a big bullet though. So, I don't know, they got six didn't get through all four of them. I don't know if this one will. I didn't see what happened to him, but I think he might've made it. Dr. Thunder. It's the exit wound. Oh, there we are. Again, like what we saw with, with the water. Very clean entrance. And kind of splice them like that. Mm. Oh, geez. Okay. Who's Diet Professor Thunder? He got clapped pretty hard. Uh, we're missing one. Did it get. Ah, uh, look. Ah, uh, look, over here. Okay. Sam's cool. He, he, his intestines are just gone now.
No. This says a lot about modern ammunition. Because <laughs> the, the, these old rounds, they're big, they're heavy. I mean, they're moving pretty fast, but I mean, you know, look, look what is, it's pretty dense. Um, about four feet of water will stop just about anything. And this isn't four feet of water, you know. I mean, if you put it all together, it's maybe like two and a half foot. But the 5.56 five, smoked through all of them. Small bullet, I mean, it's 55 grain. We're firing rounds that are uh, 140, 149, 180. That was a 189 grain bullet. That's a heavy bullet. But if you just don't have the speed, and these are all out of like 20 plus inch barrels, I believe. Uh, 18 to like 21 inch. Uh, the Mosin's like, I think like 24 inch. The shortest one's the, the Mass 36. So yeah, physics are cool. Let's do some dumb stuff now. All right, guys, so what we're gonna do now for this last bit is that we're gonna load each rifle. I'm gonna show you the loading process that was used during uh, the war, and of course, as is the normal uh, manual of arms with these rifles. Uh, the Mass 36, however, I don't have any stripper clips for that, so I'd just be like. And plus two, with that Mass 36, it was tooled, not really tooled for, but it works better with steel cased ammo. With brass ammo, the bolt gets stuck. You can go back and watch the mass sections and see that I had little issues opening it. So yeah, because again, it is a slightly bigger round. So that does happen with the Mass 36. The steel case doesn't bulge as much because it's steel, it's a harder metal than brass. So I won't be doing that with the Mass 36, but I will see if I can get a couple rounds to go through it. But for now, we're gonna go ahead with the rifles that I do have the stripper clips for, starting with the Mosin Nagant. So take your stripper clips, put them in. The holder and these are new stripper clips so they are very tight hmm <clears throat> one second So, Moses, you can... Oh, no, camera <laughs> didn't have Air Pro on. <laughs> so, as you can tell, the Moses Nagant, it is a very cheap rod that does sometime work as a gun. Uh, stripper clips, again, those are just some reproduction ones. They're not originals. Even originals for the Mosin are kind of hard to track down right now. So, yeah, but pretty clunky bolt. It, uh, it cocks on open, so that means when you open the bolt up, you got a bit of resistance there. You put the next round in. Close it. It's a lot easier to unclose than it is to open because, again, you got to cock the rifle. And again, straight bolt, too, so a little awkward at times. All right, next one. All right, now for the end field, stripper clips again, except this one holds 10 rounds. So, what you do is realize your hands are full and put one on the, on the sling. So, that. Oh my god, that's so much easier than the, than the Mosins. Goodbye. Come on, don't, and then I believe, yeah, Mosin don't do that. All right, let me not be the one with tinnitus this time. Again, we're just going for speed, not accuracy, so here we go. And that's with zero training. Yeah, so the bolt on the infield, much easier to operate. So if we're starting from empty, which again, we are. So this bolt cocks on close, which means opening it and pulling to the rear is extremely easy. And then pushing it forward is when the hammer is actually cocked. Again, let me decock it. 
So you open it up. This is the hammer here. When you push it close, that cocks the hammer. And I find that to be a lot easier of a motion and easier for like me as a shooter to manipulate it when it's cocked on close. So that's how you can be able to get those very rapid uh, firing salvos. Again, not going for accuracy. I don't think I hit anything that I was even aiming at with that type of speed, but there it is. All right, it's grand time. So, take thine in block, insert it into Garand, push down. Woo, almost get your thumb taken off because the grand thumb. <laughs> Need I say more? I can't because my earmuffs weren't on on the way. <laughs> But I heard the ping. All right, so with the Gavir 98, again, you're supposed to have stripper clips, but I couldn't find any in time for this video. So we're just going to go ahead and look, 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 look. Ah, there we go. All right, so again, we're going five rounds fast as I can work the bolt. So here we go. Huh? Huh. All right, so this bolt is cock on open. And I mean, it's the Mauser action. It's a really smooth action. This one, it's old. It's still full of cosmoline. I cleaned it out a bit. I think this what happened there with that one misfire. The uh, round didn't get picked up by the um, bolt. Either I didn't pull the bolt back far enough or maybe the magazine spring or tension rod or whatever is in there didn't quite have the elasticity to keep up with me. I think I didn't pull the bolt back far enough. So yeah, but again, it's a really smooth action uh, with the car 98 with the bolt, with the bolt, with the bent bolt hander. I think it would be a little bit faster and a lot nicer too, but there you go. All right. So now you're probably thinking, well, Sea Lord, what is the best service rifle of World War II? And well, I mean, in terms of stopping power, penetration, and well, the ability to just sling rounds down range, it's obviously the M1 Garand. And I mean, that was obvious for anyone that's into firearms or firearms history or anything like that. Now, the obvious question is, why didn't the other countries have semi-automatic rifles or why didn't they just get M1 Garands from the United States during World War II? I mean, eight rounds of 30 out six semi-automatic rifle, that's, that's quite formidable, and it was. Well, here's the thing. With the situation in Europe before the war, there are several countries, the French, the UK, the Soviet Union, they were all developing semi-automatic rifles, even Germany. The thing is, the war started before any of that was ready. The uh, SVT-44 wasn't ready until 1944, um, obviously, by the name. And with the, like the FN-49 that we talked about in the uh, FN battle rifle video, that one was being developed at the breakout of World War II and just wasn't ready in time. Now, another question, too, is, well, why didn't they just switch over to a semi-automatic rifle during the war? Well, here's a question for you. If you're the UK or France and your neighbor just invaded you with a rebuilt military and you're just facing this new type of warfare, this blitzkrieg warfare, and you have two choices. One, you can mass produce semi-automatic rifles that are halfway through development and will probably have a lot of hiccups and developmental problems for the first couple of years, or you can just print out tons and tons of bolt action rifles that you've been developing and putting out for the last 10 years the factories are made the machinists are trained on are trained on them the soldiers are trained on them and they're ready to go that's the question now why did the u.s have the m1 grand well that's what happens when you don't enter a war until a few years into it and even at the outbreak of world war ii in the pacific um not everyone in the u.s had a grand the Marines that took the fight to the Japanese, they were still using uh, Springfield 1903s rather than the Garand. It was funny because when the Army finally showed up, they had the Garand and then the Marines were still using 1903s for a while. So, 
Yes, in my humble American, maybe biased opinion, this is the single greatest rifle of World War II and one of the most historically significant rifles of, of all time. And like I said, I have a policy of no survivors, so it's time to make good on that. Where's the twist up? Twist up! Like I said, no survivors. If you guys like this video, make sure to drop a like and leave a comment down below. If you want to see more of this type of content, make sure to tell me in the comment section and subscribe to the channel. Hope you guys enjoyed. This was a blast to make, really fun to get out here and just have fun, you know. So hope you guys enjoyed. Hope to see you guys in the next one.